Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's edition of the 2023 Von Karman series. My name is Nikki Weirich from JPL's Office of Communications and Education, and thank you all so much for joining us for our wonderful discussion tonight, The Universe of Very Cold, the James Webb Space Telescope, MIRI, and the Cryo Cooler. The James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, launched about a year and a half ago and has taken some incredible images using infrared light. The optics and science instruments must be incredibly cold, especially JWST's mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI. This is not possible without the cryo cooler. Joining us as co-host for this evening discussion is Caitlin Soares, the public outreach lead for astrophysics at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, presenting data through a creative lens and making complex scientific information accessible to wide audiences. Caitlin is passionate about exploring how the convergence of art and science can serve the public. Hiya, Caitlin. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks, Nikki. And thank you to everyone online for viewing our program tonight. Um, NASA is your space program, and we wanted you to be involved in the conversation this evening. So please ask questions in the chat, and our social media team will pass them along to us. If for some reason you don't see the chat, please refresh your browser, and it should be there. We will try to ask as many of your questions as possible throughout our discussion, a discussion tonight. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to get into it. So back to you, Nikki. Awesome. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, as always, folks, if we do run into any technical difficulties or small failures tonight, we do ask for your patience and please do stick with us. We will get them sorted out as soon as we can. And now let's introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Konstantin Penanen, who led Miri's cryocooler development team through its design, build, test, and delivery to JWST system integration. He then led the Miri project as it supported the larger JWST spacecraft element and observatory integration and testing. Now, currently, he is leading payload system development for SphereX, an all sky infrared spectral survey medium explorer mission. With a background in low temperature physics, he joined JPL in 2002, wow, and worked on a variety of fundamental research, instrumentation, and flight projects. You might even say he has the coolest job at JPL. Hiya, Constantine. How are you this evening? I'm pretty good. Thank you. Awesome. We're so thankful to have you with us today. So let's jump in right off the bat. What is the James Webb Space Telescope, and what is its main mission? Well, um, the James Webb uh, Telescope uh, is a, is the most recent flagship mission that NASA launched, uh, and uh, it's uh, um, uh, it's an iconic image you can see there uh, on your screen right now. Um, this is something that has been in development uh, uh, for uh, over a decade, uh, and uh, it's uh, um, it's going to produce results uh, for many many years to come. Uh, it is an infrared mission overall. Um, what you can see there um, is uh, a, a, an iconic primary mirror uh, 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 where you, you can see a reflection of, uh, um, uh, of uh, cosmic structure behind. Uh, you can also see the uh, uh, very large diamond-like uh, feature, which is the, uh, the sun shield uh, uh, that uh, blocks the light from the sun and from, from the Earth, um, exposing the telescope to, to heat. Uh, and that is really key uh, to uh, producing infrared images there. G uh, GWST uh, will be uh, um, obtaining data in the uh, uh, range of infrared uh, wavelengths. Now, we will go into that a little bit uh, uh, more in just a little bit, uh, but uh, um, uh, the main goals for GWST um, as, a, as a user facility, as a flagship mission, uh, is uh, to serve scientists in, in uh, 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 for, for scientists to reach their their goals uh, and the main capabilities uh, uh, that uh, James Webb provides is uh, really high resolution uh, images uh, uh, in the infrared and the in the science goals uh, that come with that are looking at at stars uh, as they are born at galaxies as they were born as well as uh, um, uh, at uh, um, planets uh, uh, around stars if we uh, if we get to see them. Um, and so let, let's uh, let's go for a second uh, to image three. Um, this one uh, shows uh, the uh, history of the universe uh, uh, in a, in a very uh, compact way. Um, it, it shows the uh, uh, 
uh, going from left to right, it shows uh, uh, time spanning from the uh, from the Big Bang, from the uh, time that the uh, universe uh, came into existence, uh, up to the present time, uh, and uh, uh, over uh, the initial period of time uh, when uh, uh, this uh, really uh, hot protomaterial um, radiation coalesced into uh, into elementary particles, then uh, then atoms, then molecules, uh, and e eventually. Uh, particles of dust, and then uh, eventually started forming dust, uh, st started forming stars, and and then galaxies. Um, and uh, JWST will be looking uh, um, back in time in a way uh, because it will be able to see uh, some of the first stars that uh, that got uh, created, the first galaxies that got created. It will also uh, observe uh, stars that are getting created uh, um, now uh, in in spaces uh, uh, where. There are uh, a large uh, uh, congregations of, of dust in space. Um, it's, a, it's an exciting uh, facility, and uh, it will serve the humanity for, for many, many years. Um, let's go uh, to slide four for a second. Um, uh, and, and this is uh, to address the uh, um, question of what, what exactly, uh, how JWST is different. Um, uh, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you're familiar with the visible light, uh, uh, lights uh, ranging from uh, red to violet. Um, as I, I just wanted to note something. Um, if you look in the sky at night, uh, and, and if you're lucky to see that, if, you're, if, if the light pollution uh, uh, allows you to, um, you will generally not see uh, any green stars, um, even though it's, uh, it's right there in the spectrum. But what you will see, they're either reddish stars or bluish stars, uh, or white stars. Um, uh, red stars uh, are the ones that are tilted towards the uh, uh, infrared or red uh, part of the spectrum. Blue are on the shorter wavelength on the on the blue side. Uh, but uh, mostly that's because the uh, light from stars uh, is is a mix of uh, of various colors. Uh, and of course, our sun uh, shines nice and white, which is a combination of uh, all of these colors. Um, JWST is uh, looking at light uh, uh, to the right of uh, what is shown here um, in the visible spectrum. It's uh, it's in the infrared, and it's spanning uh, wavelengths from uh, um, about one micron uh, to about twenty five microns for various instruments. Yeah, so let's hit on that. You mentioned various instruments. JWST actually has four main instruments, but one of those JPL is responsible for, called the Mid Infrared Instrument or MIRI. So can you tell us a little bit more about how does MIRI work? Right. So the mid-infrared instrument uh, uh, is the longest wavelength uh, instrument on uh, JWST. Um, it spans the uh, wavelength from roughly 5 microns to 25 microns, just, just over. Um, and uh, it has uh, several functions. Uh, uh, it has uh, um, an imager, which is uh, essentially a camera with which you can you can take pictures, and uh, we will really spend most of the time today talking about that. It can also take spectra. Um, what that means is that it can look at a specific object in the sky, uh, and then uh, uh, figure out what uh, what compositions of that spectrum uh, show up uh, in in uh, for that particular uh, image. Um, for the imager, uh, for that object, for the imager. Uh, uh, um, MIRI also has a, a number of uh, filters that filter out light of a, a particular set of wavelengths. And uh, uh, by switching between those, it, it is also capable of taking images in, in uh, uh, different uh, bands of, uh, of wavelengths. Yeah, so it's great to hear that. Um, it, you've talked about how it's a little distinct because it uses this longer wavelength. I'd love for you to talk to us a little about image five, if we could pull that up. Can you tell us what we're seeing here in image five, Constantine? Yes, uh, this is an, uh, a great image. Uh, and uh, this is coming as a recommendation of, uh, of a project scientist, uh, uh, Mike Ressler. Um, what you see on the uh, on the right side is an image taken by another instrument on James Webb. That's, uh, that's near cam. You can see it's a lot of uh, uh, stars and galaxies there, actually galaxies mostly. Um, there, there, is a, there is a number of them, uh, but you can see that a common feature uh, for them is that uh, you see um, that reddish tint uh, uh, and bluish tint and white, uh, but you don't really see uh, anything really in between. And what that really indicates is that uh, Near CAM, uh, it's uh, taking essentially a thermal spectrum of uh, of various objects, various various galaxies. 
What you see on the left uh, is a, a mirror image uh, of, of the same field. Um, and what, uh, uh, what I'd like to highlight is, is this, is that uh, um, you can see very stark colors, including greens. Um, uh, Mike Reslov would uh, like to call it Skittles uh, uh, in the sky. <laughs> it's a very, very apt analogy. Um, the reason why the colors are so uh, so distinct there is that uh, um, there are some uh, uh, chemicals uh, in the dust uh, uh, that's that's uh, produced in uh, in galaxies. Um, it's those chemicals are akin to um, car exhaust and barbecue smoke. Uh, not very pleasant stuff, uh, but uh, um, th those are um, uh, aromatic uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, and those uh, light up at particular wavelengths. Um, and uh, if you take an image with, uh, uh, with MIRI, uh, that particular wavelength is highlighted. And some of these objects are uh, moving from us uh, uh, at, at, at various speeds, at various velocities. And as they, uh, as they move away from us, uh, the light from, from these galaxies is redshifted. So it's, it's getting longer in wavelength. But the combination of that is that you can see uh, galaxies uh, that are closer to us uh, are looking more more bluish. Uh, uh, galaxies that are further away are looking more red, but they, they also have very, very distinct colors. Yeah, I mean, so we've talked a little bit about this longest wavelength and that we can see these more interesting things. And you mentioned very briefly just then, we can see through this dust. What, why do we want to look through the dust? Why, why is that something we want to be looking through? So, um, so, so let's uh, let's uh, actually move uh, 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 to image six for a sec, um, and I'll I'll speak to to your question as well. Um, so, uh, dust obscures uh, uh, light uh, uh, as uh, as it comes uh, uh, from from galaxies, uh, and particularly uh, in nebulae, uh, when you have uh, uh, dust, you can you cannot really see. Uh, material light uh, from behind there. And so if you take an image uh, uh, invisible or near infrared, uh, you would uh, uh, able to see only the light from objects uh, that doesn't pass through that dust. And, and then in the in the infrared, uh, you, in the uh, uh, mid infrared, uh, you get more of the light uh, coming through uh, the, the dust. And you can see uh, objects uh, um, uh, that you otherwise wouldn't, uh, uh, stars that are hidden otherwise. Uh, uh, in places that they are born uh, in, in those nebulae, um, and uh, and then on this image, what you what you see uh, is a, a, a debris disk. Uh, um, uh, what what you can see here is uh, effectively a, a a solar system that is uh, uh, in the in the process of getting born. This is really probably how our solar system looked uh, uh, four or four and a half billion years ago. Um, the, you can see there uh, two distinct rings. Um, the outer ring was something that uh, that was uh, uh, seen before before JWST launched uh, for for decades. The inner uh, ring is something that was uh, uh, possible to see uh, only with JWST and MIRI uh, uh, basically in the last year. And what uh, what you can see there uh, really what that what that really uh, corresponds to in our solar system. The outer ring is. Uh, um, uh, looking like an Oort cloud, it's uh, similar to our own Oort cloud. That's a uh, uh, Pluto orbit and beyond. Uh, and uh, the inner ring here uh, corresponds to what we have for the asteroid belt. And uh, and the fact that these are really well defined that really means that uh, that those uh, dust particles are interacting with gravity centers. So there is pl uh, uh, probably something that uh, that looks like a planetary system uh, in there. It's a, it's again. I mean, it's a, it's one of the things that uh, that we see with the uh, with the infrared. And the fact that uh, the uh, uh, rings are so bright that indicates that uh, there is some heat dissipating uh, uh, in there. That means that those particles are colliding with each other uh, all the time, producing a little bit of that heat. Wow, that's incredible to think that just looking at this image, like when we talk about our own solar system, we can only see what is essentially as far out as Pluto and the Oort cloud. But now with Miri. We can see so much more detail in this image. That's, I just think that's amazing. Um, so we talked a little bit about the dust and we talked a little bit about Miri, but this instrument, it does great things, but it needs to be incredibly cold in order to work, right, Constantine? That's correct. And uh, let me tell you first why. Um, mm -hmm. So, so if, uh, um, 
the the infrared what we really see with the infrared is is uh, is heat um uh, if you uh, I, I mentioned wavelengths of light um between uh, uh 5 and 25 microns per milli uh, 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 right in the middle of that is roughly 10 microns and that is uh, uh, the wavelength at which uh, all of us are radiating heat uh so as we walk around uh, most of the uh, most of the spectrum that's emitted from from human bodies at roughly 300 kelvin uh, is uh, at about 10 micron wavelength. What that really means is that uh, if we launch the telescope at 300 Kelvin, uh, we would be blinded by the telescope itself. Uh, we wouldn't really see anything. So the telescope needs to cool off. Uh, that's one. Uh, and then uh, in order to detect the light at this wavelength, uh, uh, it all has to come down to a detector. Uh, let me uh, share an image, uh, image 12, please. Um, that's an image of uh, uh, one of uh, uh, three uh, MIRI detectors. Uh, it really is very similar uh, if, if you open up your camera, if you have an uh, ability to do so to remove your lens, uh, you will see something looking kind of similar to that. It's, uh, it's about an inch by an inch uh, uh, size uh, uh, is square, and uh, it's, it senses, in, in this case, uh, infrared. Uh, the technology in, in order to see uh, infrared of this wavelength uh, is such that uh, the detectors need to run really, really cold. And for us, uh, uh, the, the, the temperature at which the detector run uh, need, need to be uh, below seven uh, Kelvin. And MIRI runs uh, uh, its detectors uh, uh, at a temperature of uh, roughly six Kelvin. Um, so, uh, so for both reasons, uh, for detector technology reasons, and not to be swamped by the uh, light from the instrument itself, everything needs to be cold. I, I get that it needs to be cold, but it's kind of cold in parts of space. This needs to be even colder than that, right? What's the difference between passive cooling, which is used by a lot of the other instruments on board uh, GAWST, and the active cooling used for MIRI? That's that's right. So uh, for the longer wavelength between one and five microns, uh, a combination of uh, more tolerance uh, uh, to this background uh, and uh, uh, more tolerance to um, uh, or or, or uh, different detector technology, um, those detectors uh, can run at a temperature of uh, thirty Kelvin and even even above that. Uh, and that temperature is possible uh, to meaningfully achieve uh, uh, with passive cooling. And what that really means is that. Uh, um, if you if you look into the deep of uh, of space and and you don't have any heat sources nearby, uh, and you shield yourself uh, from the uh, uh, light and heat of the sun and and earth and moon, um, you will eventually reach the temperature of the microwave uh, background radiation, which is uh, three point uh, three three point seven Kelvin. Um, so you can passively cool. Uh, you can cool to thirty. Um, uh, to get to uh, a temperature of uh, 5.9 or, or 6 Kelvin, uh, that is not really meaningfully uh, possible. Just very tiny amounts of heat dissipation that we need to have in the detectors uh, and, and attempts at passive cooling would just uh, uh, take it over the edge. Uh, and, uh, and therefore we need to do active, active cooling. So Constantine, just to clarify, the passive cooling is very similar to what you were talking about with the sunshade earlier when we looked at that first image, right? That is correct, yes. So you put the sunshade uh, uh, to block yourself from, uh, from the sun, uh, and then uh, you put uh, something that's painted uh, black, dark, uh, that, uh, that does a really good job of emitting in the infrared. Uh, uh, you point it uh, to the uh, uh, deep of space, uh, and uh, and th that's how you get uh, uh, to to those temperature of, uh, of 30 Kelvin. And and uh, uh, other missions uh, uh, rely on on just that method of of cooling. Uh, many missions do, uh, including uh, SphereX that uh, that you heard a little bit earlier. Uh, but for uh, for Miri, that's not enough. Uh, for uh, Miri, uh, we need to do active cooling. And let me uh, jump into into what that is. Um, uh, for in order for us to uh, cool MIRI, we use a cryo cooler, and cryo cooler is a fancy name for a uh, for a refrigerator that works really really cold. Uh, cryo stands for cold, cooler means for cooler. Uh, uh, if you, uh, I'll I'll show a picture. Um, uh, can we go to image uh, uh, fourteen, please? So. Um, what you have here is uh, is sort of the heart of the of the Miri cryo cooler. 
uh, it's uh, a, a several compressors. Uh, what you see there in those uh, cylinders uh, is pistons uh, uh, that move back and forth. Um, and some, uh, uh, some of them uh, at uh, one of them at, uh, at 30 times a second, another one at 90 times a second. Uh, and it, it compresses gas uh, uh, and then expands it. Um, so as a gas is compressed, uh, it gets heated up. Uh, um, you take away that heat and uh, uh, radiate it away uh, into space. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, you expand the gas and then uh, that cools that gas off a little bit more. Um, and then you repeat that uh, many times a second, uh, and you do that in several stages. Uh, you take the first stage, uh, uh, you cool that to something like 150 Kelvin, next stage to 50, next stage to 18. Uh, and, and, and the final stage, uh, you get to something uh, like, uh, like 6 Kelvin. It's a little bit more complex than that. And if you want to uh, look for more detail, uh, just uh, use your web browser and search for uh, Miri Crackle. You'll find a lot more. Uh, but uh, uh, generally, that's what this is. It's uh, it's the uh, the most awesome refrigerator in space. Um, it's uh, it consumes power. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with the incandescent light bulbs, we used to have those. Um, it uses the roughly light of uh, of or power of of two light bulbs. It's uh, just over uh, 100 watts, uh, and it achieves the temperature uh, of uh, of six Kelvin. Constantine, this is the most awesome cooler in space, that is for sure. But how does something like this get designed and built? Well, that's a, a an enormously uh, a complex process and long process and uh, something that involved uh, a very large number of, uh, of, of folks. Um, uh, the the concept uh, uh, for for this cryo cooler uh, uh, predated uh, uh, GWC concept uh, uh, and and has been in development for a while. Uh, it's a team effort. Um, the cryo cooler uh, was developed at, at Northrop Grumman. Uh, the effort is led by uh, by uh, JPL. Um, uh, what is uh, what is happening is that uh, we start with the design. We demonstrate that uh, the design works on the prototype. Uh, and then we start uh, designing flight hardware, um, and then uh, uh, then piece by piece build it up, uh, and then uh, then test it, uh, test it thoroughly. Uh, we go through uh, environmental testing, which means that uh, we expose the uh, the hardware that we build uh, uh, to equivalents of uh, rocket launch uh, and the. Uh, deep of space for uh, thermal reasons. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, it's a rigorous uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, rigorous process that's uh, common to uh, many NASA missions, uh, and and Cryocooler uh, had to experience that. So, Constantine, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the development? And let's pull up image fifteen. And can you tell us what you see on that image? Right. So um, this is the uh, last stage. This is the heat. Uh, <coughs> This is the uh, cold head assembly. This is something that is mounted uh, right next to the uh, um, to the instrument uh, uh, to the uh, um, optical bench uh, of Miri. Uh, uh, you you saw that detector, uh, so that that detector would be within a couple of feet from uh, from this uh, uh, coffee can. Um, uh, so uh, the, this portion of the cryo cooler is uh, is right next to the uh, to the instrument, which also means that uh, it's uh, if you remember the from from image um, of GLBST, Let's actually go to image two for a sec. Um, uh, you can see here the the primary mirror. Uh, uh, what we are talking about is what's behind the primary mirror. What's what's happening really for GLBST is uh, light bounces off of the primary. Hits the secondary. That's the thing that is sticking out, supported by uh, by uh, those uh, three struts, and then uh, uh, hits a tertiary that is uh, in that uh, uh, extended uh, knob there, and then uh, it, it the light is distributed to an, uh, a number of instruments. Uh, all of those live behind uh, behind the mirror, um, and and that's where where Miri is one of those instruments. Uh, so of what you saw, and let's go back to image fifteen. Uh, what you saw is uh, the cold head assembly that eventually got integrated uh, uh, into the uh, in integrated science instrument module. Let's go to uh, image 17 for a second. What you see here, uh, and uh, you just saw that coffee can um, by itself, and, and now uh, this is uh, that same uh, cold head assembly. 
uh, that is uh, sitting uh, next to MIRI Optical Bench. MIRI was the first instrument integrated. Uh, I, we're very proud of that. Um, uh, and uh, and here you can see uh, uh, just uh, moments after after the uh, uh, this uh, cold head assembly uh, got uh, got installed uh, uh, onto um, onto ISM integrated science instrument module. And there's a, a little bit clearer picture on image 18. Yeah, what what you can see here is uh, is just before. Uh, um, well, you, you you can see here the same uh, heat exchanger stage assembly, uh, uh, cold head assembly, uh, as well as uh, somewhat opened up uh, uh, image of uh, uh, Miri optical bench. I do want to mention uh, uh, one thing. I, I had mentioned that uh, um, GPL was uh, uh, responsible for uh, for Miri. GPL was responsible for Miri uh, from uh, uh, NASA perspective for the uh, uh, US segment of uh, of this work. But MIRI is uh, an international collaboration uh, with uh, ESA and MIRI uh, European Consortium. It's a 50-50 partnership. Uh, European uh, partners uh, built up the optical bench, um, and then they included uh, GPL built uh, detectors in that optical bench. Um, and then uh, uh, GPL was responsible for uh, for the detectors as well as the cryo cooler, and and the, and the cryo cooler work is what I'm describing here. So Constantine, since you brought it up, uh, it takes a whole bunch of people to do something like this. So what was it like, the team behind the scenes that was able to build both Miri and the cryo cooler? I think this is the, the most amazing, uh, uh, really uh, multi-year, multi-institution development. Um, it's uh, it spanned, of course, many, many years. Um, was uh, trying at some point uh, uh, to count number of people who touched uh, Miri flight hardware, and the, uh, the number uh, eventually goes into thousands. Um, if uh, if you if you count all of the components that uh, had to come together, uh, and uh, and the Miri car cooler, uh, I already mentioned Northrop Grumman. We also had uh, our contributions uh, into the hardware, uh, both from JPL uh, and from uh, Gorod Space Flight Center. Um, but uh, but the the team is 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 large, and uh, and uh, they had to. Uh, follow the hardware uh, from the design stage uh, all the way into the in integration. Um, and uh, there are a number of interfaces between different pieces of hardware. What that, what that means is that uh, when you build something like that, you need to know that it's going to fit when you put it into, into the next thing, which means that you need to have people talking to each other uh, all along, making sure that that's, uh, that goes uh, smoothly. Uh, and that uh, goes not just to uh, mechanical integration. It also means that you have to agree on how the power is going to be used, uh, how the data is going to be transmitted. All of those details are quite complex. And uh, it's uh, it's amazing how this came together uh, as a system at the end. Absolutely. And if we could pull up image 23 real quick, this is only a small fraction of the team that you worked with, right, Constantine? That's correct. So uh, this is the... Uh, 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 a part of Miri Cry Cooler. This is uh, the compressor assembly. Uh, just before uh, it got uh, shipped from uh, Northrop Grumman uh, uh, to JPL, and and the team that is displayed there is a combination of uh, of JPL folks and Northrop folks as as we worked together. Um, I think this this was uh, uh, a, 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 a a significant development for uh, for both entities, and uh, and uh, and the team was extremely dedicated and uh, and very skilled. Uh, it's uh, for, for many of us. Uh, um, it, it's uh, it really is an accomplishment of a, of a lifetime. It's uh, it's 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 quite amazing. So Constantine, I want to leave plenty of time for the audience questions, but I've got one last question for you before we open it up to them. What do we expect to see from the cryo cooler in the coming years? Well. Um, uh, we expect the cryo cooler to uh, continue chugging along. Uh, there is nothing in the cryo cooler uh, that is uh, is limiting its life. Uh, um, eventually, uh, electronics in space uh, tends to uh, deteriorate and die uh, just because it's exposed to radiation. So at some point, that will start happening. Um, so far, uh, things are behaving really well. Um, and uh, and for JLBST in general. Uh, uh, the life really is limited by the uh, station keeping maneuvers uh, uh, that the amount of fuel on board uh, is is going to eventually limit. Uh, but it's not going to happen for, for years and years to come. Um, I did want to show uh, how uh, this all comes together. Can we go to image 25 for just a sec? Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, so this is the uh, integration of the observatory overall. Uh, and uh, uh, in the middle of that image, you can see uh, a little harmonica uh, looking like shiny object. Uh, and that's just a, a little portion of the of the cryo cooler that, that, that uh, is sticking out through there. If we go to image 26 for a sec, you can see uh, that uh, cryo cooler uh, getting moved uh, uh, from below the observatory to be integrated. And, uh, and uh, um, eventually, uh, th this hardware had to be connected to uh, uh, the two different pieces of, uh, of cryo cooler, uh, the one uh, that's uh, close to the instrument and the one that is running in the, in the spacecraft bus. They needed to be uh, tied together, and that was happening at the uh, at the very end of the integration. With that, I, I do want to show uh, uh, when the work was complete. Uh, can we go to image twenty seven for a sec? So this is uh, this is the team uh, uh, after the cryo cooler got integrated, uh, and uh, we just happened to, to be uh, at at Northrop Grumman when they were also doing the test deployments of the mirrors. Uh, and uh, uh, this is just a, 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 a wonderful picture. Uh, but I, I, my, my favorite picture, and uh, let's go to image 28 for a sec. Uh, <laughs> uh, is this one not because of the face there? Uh, but I asked for this image uh, to be taken because what you see there is what's behind, uh, behind the curtain, behind the mirror. Uh, this was the time uh, after the cryo cooler got the in, uh, installed uh, into GWST. Uh, we needed to make sure that uh, um, all of the connections, all of the pneumatic connections, uh, I, I mentioned that the gas that's getting compressed and, uh, uh, and expanded, uh, that none of that gas is leaking out. Uh, and so this is after we made final integration of the cryo cooler, we needed to do that leak check. Uh, and, uh, and that work is happening on the background right here. This, this was, uh, um, I think we were the last to be at the heart of the observatory uh, to, to perform that measurement. Uh, and when we were done, we were, uh, we were very, very happy. Constantine, I have to say that is also my favorite image that you have pulled <laughs> up so far this evening. Uh, they have been asking a lot of great questions online. So folks, thank you for those questions. Caitlin, what are they asking? We have a lot of questions here, Constantine. Um, I'm gonna start with kind of an umbrella question, but can you speak a little bit to um, what the key science objectives are of the James Webb Space Telescope? And to add on to that, how is NERI supporting those objectives? Right, so, so the key objectives uh, um, uh, would be uh, to uh, uh, look at, uh, at the first light uh, from, uh, from the universe. Um, uh, th this would be the creation, the light from the first, uh, uh, from the first galaxies, the formation of first galaxies. We're beginning to see some of that, those results already. Um, there is an uh, objective uh, um, for um, uh, JWST is uh, to be able to observe uh, uh, birth of stars and planets. Um, that is also something that uh, already has been happening in the, in the last year. Um, and uh, um, a last and more, uh, and, and more recent uh, addition to the uh, set of goals uh, uh, for GWST was looking at exoplanets, um, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, the variety of, uh, of uh, solar systems uh, where you would have uh, exoplanets. Uh, um, that, uh, uh, that our understanding of that uh, grew in size quite a bit uh, in the last few years, and GWST uh, certainly is, uh, is, is now making it its focus. Great. Um, we have another question here. Um, Farrell on LinkedIn asks, what are some of the surprising results from MIRI observations so far? Could you speak to um, one or two of those? Well, uh, I, I, <laughs> so I, I do want to say a couple of things. I, I, um, I, I, I am an engineer, <laughs> although I am very, very curious about the science that MIRI is, is going to achieve. Uh, but I do want to say that, uh, you know, one, one, one image that, uh, that I showed about that uh, uh, inner ring, uh, that was a surprise. Uh, uh, the Skittles, uh, that, was, uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, uh, it's just looking at a variety of that. Uh, of, of of that that was that was really good. I, I do want to show uh, something. Can we go to image nine for a sec? So 
So uh, in the image that you're just about to look at, uh, image nine, uh, what you can see uh, uh, was one of the first things that uh, uh, that folks uh, very quickly uh, found even during the the commissioning of the of the Krakow, or that uh, sorry commissioning of the of GWST. This was looking uh, with uh, with Miri. Uh, at the same uh, part of the sky uh, as another mission, uh, Spitzer uh, uh, looked at before. Uh, uh, this this is around eight micron wavelength. This is basically the difference. Uh, you can see uh, uh, what what Miri can do. It look it it looks uh, uh, at uh, at details. Uh, Miri and JWST overall. It looks uh, at uh, at objects with far more detail, uh, and 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 that's where where the focus really is uh, is uh, is uh, um, to to find places uh, uh, to to observe things uh, with much more clarity than before. That's an awesome. Okay, we have another okay. question. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, we have a, we have a lot more. of questions, a lot of questions coming in. Um, I don't know if you want to answer this, Constantine, but I'm going to throw it at you. What would happen if, for any reason, the cryocooler got damaged or was in need of repair? Ooh, um, yeah. So, um, I, I, unlike Hubble, um, there is not a plan for a service mission. Um, um, so, uh, what really needed to happen is uh, is for us to build it in a way that it's uh, it's robust and reliable. Um, I mentioned electronics that uh, potentially uh, will get damaged uh, uh, by, by radiation. Um, we actually have two of everything there for electronics. So if uh, if we have uh, a a particular component uh, uh, that failed on us, uh, we have an ability to uh, swap out. I mean, to switch out to uh, to a second uh, uh, one of the same. Um, of course, uh, there are. Uh, other possibilities, uh, uh, you know, nightmares are built of those things. Uh, we can have a, a micrometeoroid hit uh, just in the wrong spot, and we can have uh, helium leaking out, or you know, or or some some other type of damage. Um, we uh, were careful to calculate uh, uh, what those effects might be and uh, build some design features that protect from uh, most of that. Uh, we should be good, um, but uh, but uh, no, uh, sorry, no uh, no plan to to uh, to repair. All right. And um, speaking of design features, um, what types of metals, lubricants, etc., are used for the cryo cooler components to function at such a low temperature? Uh, well, that's 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 really interesting. So. Um, uh, because we have to design for very long life, um, uh, uh, cryo coolers, uh, these very reliable cryo coolers, um, they are now built without lubricants. Uh, they are built uh, with very, very tight tolerances mechanically, um, so that you would end up uh, uh, with uh, with not something that uh, uh, rubs against each other. Um, it's a uh, it's a, a, a uh, it's a difficult problem, uh, but it has been for the most part solved. Um, so. So no lubricants. Um, uh, again, uh, there are no features here that are really life limiting. Uh, I think everything that we thought uh, mechanically through uh, uh, makes us think that it's it's going to last. Great, thank you. Um, that question came from Johnny on YouTube. This one comes from Jorge on Facebook, um, who's asking, actually a few folks have asked this, where does the heat from Miri go? Like, what what happens to the heat as the cryo cooler is bringing the temperature down? Oh, that's a really excellent question. So, um, uh, the cryo cooler takes away heat from one spot and it has to dump it elsewhere. Uh, so, it takes away the heat from the instrument, uh, and uh, and through these stages of cooling, um, it pumps it out eventually to radiators that are on the warm side of the spacecraft. It's actually on the sun facing side. Uh, and so the heat is getting rejected at roughly room temperature. Uh, this is uh, uh, for convenience of, uh, of testing, but also it's something that we know how to reliably work with. So yes, uh, the heat is getting um, uh, getting pumped uh, from uh, from the uh, cold region into warm region, and uh, that takes energy. Um, that's that's what the, those uh, 100 watts or so of uh, of power are needed for. 
sounds like a lot of work for that cryo cooler. <laughs> um, we have, we, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. We have a lot of great questions in here. Um, we have time for one more. Ronald on Facebook asks, um, I am an eight-year-old and I'm learning to be a scientist. My <laughs> ultimate goal is to work for NASA when I'm grown up. Uh, could you share any advice uh, to, to help me achieve my goal for working at NASA as a scientist? Oh, what a great question. Um, what I would say is that uh, um, follow your heart, uh, be curious, um, find what uh, what appeals to you, um, and it it can be a lot of things. It can be it can be uh, various areas of of science, uh, physics, chemistry. Um, uh, it can be uh, uh, is something that uh, uh, is uh, engineering field uh, of some sort. So you can you can go and, and do mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. Uh, thermal engineering, uh, uh, many, many fields uh, uh, lead to uh, a, a path at NASA and uh, at, at a mission like that. Again, out of those uh, 10,000 people, uh, the, the, the variety of fields that, uh, that folks came, uh, came in with, uh, and I, I don't want to um, uh, admit people who uh, uh, do the mechanical work of, uh, of uh, machining parts, uh, um, Putting things together, uh, uh, basically technicians uh, uh, that that solder parts in place. Uh, those are callings that uh, that also uh, are key to success here. Uh, thank you for that wonderful advice. And uh, as Caitlin said, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today for those wonderful questions you all have been asking out there. I want to take a moment to thank our speaker, one of the coolest guys at JPL, Dr. Constantine Penanen, for joining us to discuss the cryo cooler and Miri. Also, thank you to our wonderful questions co-host, Caitlin Soares, and everyone working behind the scenes to make this possible. To all of you watching at home, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us each and every month. And by the way, if you did miss one or would like to revisit any of our Von Karman talks from the past five years, they're all available on JPL's YouTube page. Please do also join us next month for our discussion with Dr. Stacey Boland, vital work to benefit all humankind. Thank you so much, everyone, and we will see you in July.